Thank you. Thank you for attending. Uh, so if you had some really pleasant uh, presentations in the morning with Keith, Keith works in a different, in a different area, he's from pre-sales. Um, I'm a developer, so now you're going to have the hardcore details of, of how things are done and uh, the type of development that we do. So I'm going to talk about the new feature in my SQL later application. And like Keith said in the morning, uh, replication is the most used area and the area that has more focus in MySQL. Uh, I typically do this question, which is, who in the audience uses MySQL replication? Um, I don't know if you know, if you are aware of MySQL replication, but uh, MySQL replication was something that was born, it was not born at the same time that my MySQL was born, but it was born with the same mindset of MySQL, meaning that MySQL was that database that probably if you started a project, not necessarily an open source project, but a project during the 90s, you would use MySQL. And why would you use MySQL to do this? You would use MySQL because it was simple. It was that database that was there. It was really simple to use. And it has another secret, which was <clears throat> it, it was supported in Windows, but I won't say that. Uh, but that was important to, to grow the user base because it was some, something that was really simple to use and install. So people started using it. But the thing is that MySQL evolved um, and the world evolved. Both things evolved. So the world evolved to be distributed and those companies that started possibly on a basement and like Keith said uh, on his last presentation, possibly started on Windows, evolved to big Linux boxes and evolved to be things like Booking, uh, which are really big companies. For instance, Booking has thousands of MySQL servers running. And the thing is that MySQL powers it's the backbone for much of those companies, okay? And as such, and having the notion of that, we grew with it. And we grew with it, but we grew with it in a multitude of platforms, with a multitude of data, which is completely heterogeneous from the point of view of our customers. Like like it said, we have customers like Uber, we, and we have customers like Booking, and we have customers like Facebook, which have complete different data sets, okay? And we need to talk with them all and with the community and with everyone to create a good database that will suit everyone's needs. Um, at the same time, the, the, the technology to, to access the data uh, nowadays is completely distributed. So you don't have, uh, it's, it's not like you are accessing on, a, on a, the things on a local network or in a local PC, you're accessing all, all around the world. And at, at the same time, it's not one table or two. We're talking about possibly thousands of tables and large amount of data that you want to, like I said there in the slide, you want to handle, transform, and store. And nowadays you want to do analytics on it. You want to do a ton of things with the data. And it's not, we're not, in, uh, again, we're not talking about 100 megs. We're talking about gigabytes or even terabytes of data. Um, on top of that, you have offline periods that are horribly expensive, not only horribly expensive, but nowadays those offline periods get amplified on social networks and in social media. If something happens to a company, for instance, WhatsApp is down or Facebook is down, it's completely amplified. Uh, Twitter amplifies that, uh, WhatsApp amplifies that because there are a multitude of means of communication. So a company cannot cope or it's should not cope with those downtimes, and the database should not be the culprit of them. We also have green requirements, so we need to do more with less in terms of power. We have a ton of things to store in terms of amount of data and, like I said, heterogeneous of data. And if that's not enough, we need to process that quick, okay? Uh, I think that most of you 
get bored when a web page, I don't know, it takes like 30 seconds to load. You completely lost your mind. How is this? How can this be nowadays? Uh, and having all of that in mind, MySQL and MySQL replication was designed from the ground up to consider distributed systems. And that's a key differentiator from other databases, okay? Um, since the beginning, MySQL, rep, MySQL and MySQL replication were designed having that on account. So replication in MySQL was born uh, with a simple premise, which is it needs to be simple, okay? Uh, so you have your app, you do your inserts, you do your inserts on the server, and we call this the master server, and then they magically appear on the slave server, okay? This with some, let's say, simple commands, two or three commands, the DBA could do this setup. It's quite easy, okay? And this is, since, this is like this since the beginning, okay? Uh, it's not like everything was, was cumbersome and now it's easy, no. It's easy since the beginning, since this uh, the replication was launched in, I think it was 3.23 or aeons ago. And this is how this is how it works. So you do the insert. So the uh, one thing that we should emphasize is the fact that MySQL replication is not a physical replication. For instance, like like Oracle. Okay, Oracle has physical replication and acts on the on the physical side. Um, MySQL acts on the logical side of things. That's why you can do, like Keith said in the morning, again, you can do things like you can replicate from Linux to Windows, okay? Because the replication is logical, okay? It's not, it's not physical. It's only physical in the way that it might use a file on disk. So you do your app, you do your app insert, you have the server, and as you know, MySQL has storage engines. The storage engine captures the transaction, it inserts it on a, what we call the binary log, <clears throat> which is a logical log of changes on the, on the database. That's created and modified, and it's transferred via a communication framework, okay? In the past, it was a classical protocol, MySQL protocol connection. Nowadays, it has evolved to be something more than that. It's inserted on what we call a relay log, which is something equivalent to the binary log on the slave side. It's consumed with, let's say, some threads. It goes to the it goes to the to the server, let's the slave server, and then it could be inserted and relayed again to a binary log, and the changes are written there. So this is the format of the of the binary log. So it's like I said, it's a logical replication log. It could be a replicated log. In the beginning, we only had what we call the statement-based replication, which was something that literally replicated. Here, you had, for instance, if you have done uh, update row, whatever, with value one, with value five, you would have a text, and let's say a text entry here. And this has evolved to what we call row, which is, it is a log of the actual physical changes in the database on the data set. Uh, each transaction is split into a group of events. And this is more visible since 5.6, because since 5.6 we have what we call the global transaction ID, which is something that delimits very well where a transaction starts and where a transaction ends, okay? Uh, and you have some more, let's say, let's call it control events, um, which are things that we insert here in the middle to, to help us develop this. <clears throat> So this is the this is the story of replication. So it started here, 3.23 aeons ago, which is simple asynchronous replication. It's what we have since then out of the box, and it's very easy to configure. Since 5.5, we have something which is called semi-synchronous replication, which is basically the same as this, but with an acknowledgement, meaning that you only release this if when you receive an acknowledgement that the transaction is here and ready to be committed. And at the end, what we will focus today, which is the next generation of replication, which is group replication. So the shared nothing solution that is embedded uh, within MySQL today. What, what are the use cases? So 
I've rented this presentation. This is from my boss. Okay, so we invented this. This is the acronym RACE, which is what we want to do today with replication. This is kind of in general, but the goals for MySQL are these ones. We want to replicate, automate, integrate, scale, and enhance. Okay, these are the these are the key words from from MySQL. So replicate is is kind of obvious, right? Because we want to have this infrastructure as much available as possible in terms of having it available. So avoid not having any of the database servers here, plus dealing with, with um, what we call peaks, okay? So imagine that you have an application. The booking guys once told me that they have their othermost peak after they have the Champion League match. Uh, when, when you know where the Champion League match will happen and when they know the World Cup will happen, okay? So booking has a peak and they've measured, they've measured this like pinpoint. So they have a peak when, they, when you know the, the, the draw for the matches, okay? They will happen there on that city, on that city, on that city. In that moment, they need to add servers, okay? And that's, that's the goal of this. So you want to avoid downtime and you want to avoid peaks. So it should be very easy to add more servers here, removing according to your workloads. At the same time, you don't want to... We're used to the DBA. We're used to two types of DBAs, okay? We're used to the DBA that optimizes the usage of the database. And we're used to the other DBA, which is, let's call it the physical guy that goes and adds servers, removes servers provisions, new servers. And that type of task is something that could be automated. And group replication and the new generation of replication, what it does is exactly that. So it's, it's the, the operation of the physical part of managing the databases could be automated and it's automated with our product. Meaning that you have primaries and secondaries, you write to the primaries, when a primary crashes, it's replaced by a new primary. The group here is self-healing, meaning that if, for instance, even if it's not a primary, this example only, only draws upon the primary, but if you, if you have a secondary server, if it crashes, the rest of the group detects that it crashed, it's, it removes, it removes uh, that element. So all of, those all, all of those tasks that are repetitive could be with our solution could be, let's say, eliminated and could be completely automated. And those persons that, for instance, dealt with that can be, can go to, for instance, to the, to, the, to the logical part and help the developers to develop better applications. One important part is what I referred in the, in the beginning, which is data. You need to, for instance, to do analytics, uh, you, need to be, you need to be sure that you can move your data outside of MySQL, not necessarily on, on SQL statements and stuff like that, but you need to be able to extract it and transform it. Since the binary log is a logical log, it's easy to do this. Plus, uh, within, our, within MySQL, of course, open source, you have what we call the libbin log event, which is something that allows us to parse this, okay? Without having to code a specific binary parser and go through this and hop like this and hop like that. So it's available out of the box the way to pick up this and be able to, to, to mine the binary log and extract your information and put it wherever you want to put it. Having said it, all of that, one thing that's important, it's also disaster recovery. And we can mix and match what I said. For instance, we can have your group replication with these self-healing properties and all of that. And then you can have slave connections from the asynchronous replication to create read replicas. And then you can have a disaster recovery zone when you, when you can replicate between clusters and mix and match all of that to have read scale out, to have your guarantees of automation, and to have a disaster recovery scenario. Everything comes in, comes in together with this in which we call DynoDB cluster, in which Keith already spoke about it, meaning that you write your applications without knowing whatever is, is beneath, okay? You write here your application, use a MySQL connector 
now with the with a fantastic X API that you don't need to write SQL anymore. You just write instructions. Then you have the router in which the router has its own data to know to which server to write. You do your read scale outs, and then you have the shell with the admin API in which Keith also spoke about it, in which you can use <coughs> you can use JavaScript to configure all of this. Okay, it's really easy. Give it a try. So, I will deep dive now in the enhancement, the specific enhancements in MySQL 8. If I'm going too fast, please warn me. If you have any doubts, please interrupt me. Forgot to say this in the beginning. So, this is a deep dive on the enhancements, the specific enhancements of MySQL 8. And the biggest, uh, let's say, the biggest feature that was out lately was the consistency. Because our system is what we call an eventual consistent system. So you write in one node. We have a Paxos implementation underneath. So it's a consensus algorithm that is what that was implemented. When someone's, whenever I say you using Paxos, that's impossible. No, we have a Paxos implementation to deal with this. And the Paxos gives us the total order. So the implementation of group application is a little bit when someone says that the academic, it's impossible to bring things from the academical world to the real world. This is one implementation of it, okay? Because we implement the database, uh, we implement we implement the um, database, it's not database replication, it's the database. Um, I'll, I'll remind you, I'll, I'll, it will get into my mind. So we implement exactly that. So we use a consensus algorithm to determine not the order of the transactions, but the order in which writes happen on every node so that we can have automatic, not conflict resolution, but to have automatic conflict detection. And then if you're writing on the same data at the same time in different nodes, you are able to roll back. The magic happens, sorry, database state machine. It's a state machine because when you are able to detect if you have two writes on the same data set on two different nodes, we use the consensus algorithm to give us a total order upon that, okay? The transaction is, trans so when you do a write on the node, the transaction goes to the other nodes via the consensus algorithm. It arrives to the other nodes and the other nodes are able to say, okay, cool, I don't have any conflict, please, you can commit that transaction. So we guarantee that every node receives the same transaction in the same order. But we don't guarantee the time that from that conflict resolution to the time that the transaction is written, it's actually written in the database, we cannot guarantee that time. So that could happen. You could have, for instance, three nodes on a group and two nodes are really fast and one other node is really slow. Okay? Although we have flow control for that, we cannot control that, that slow node already has the freshest information as possible, okay? So in that leg, having said that, that leg means that we are eventually consistent. So eventually, if you do select upon the row that you change, you will eventually have the same value in all nodes. Of course, that someone said to us, but I want more than that. I want to be sure that my data is on that node and it's a fresh data when, I, when, I, when I'm able to read it. And we said, ah, okay, so we do some acts and everything will be all right. But more than that, you, you can have two levels of consistency. You can have what we say here, read consistency, in which you make sure that on your local node, you read the freshest data possible, meaning that you need to flush your write queue into the, the transactional engine before reading the data that you want. And then you have the right synchronization, okay? In which you need to make sure that you're going to write on the freshest data possible, okay? And these two solutions do not necessarily intersect. There, Those are different ways of doing not necessarily the same, but are two different ways to guarantee that you're either reading the freshest data or that you're modifying your data set using the freshest data possible. So we created two, what we call the before consistency, which we, we wait for all the preceding transaction to complete. Then we read the value. 
then we execute upon the freshest snapshot of data, and then we have then we have the what what I spoke in the beginning the what we wait for the other ones for X to happen on on my transaction in which we actually wait for each and every transaction and our own to synchronize upon the the freshest amount of data. With that said, you can combine both. So you want to be sure that you're able to read the freshest data and when you write it, you're able to use the most, to, to guarantee that the group has, the entire group has the most up-to-date data. And then, this is a let's say that this is a special one, you want to guarantee that when your primary node crashes, you guarantee that when the new secondary node takes over, it will take over with the freshest with the freshest data, meaning that it will take over with every node on the same state with the same data. Okay. So this is this is a, a graphical example. So this is the eventual consistency, which is a default one. So no one waits for no one. So you want to put x equals five where x equals one. And then you have your application doing read x. For instance, here in C, you already have the, the value. But here in A, you don't have the value. And you, you wrote it in B. So what means is that x will read as 1. Okay. Eventually, it will, eventually, okay, it will, um, it will read, it will read 5. But now it will read 1, because the transaction is still not here. With the before, what happens is that it knows that the transactions are flowing, it knows that it received the transaction, you will wait that this transaction is written on the on the on the agent before it reads the value. Okay? It's like a flush. Okay. My queue, my right queue is flush, then I will read it. Okay, now I read the freshest value in my local node. This is a local operation, okay? This is the most complex operation, okay? Because this needs this needs a communication round between all group members because you need to know that everyone has flushed their queues before you write it, you write your transaction on disk okay then you guarantee that you have a baseline then you do the write so this this is the most complicated in terms of message passing okay the other one is just local you go to your queue okay i have here some things to write okay write your things there and then in the end i will write my thing i will read my things here you need to make sure that everyone has already committed to their queues. So it's a little bit different. Uh, this is the, the primary, primary failover. So like I said, a new primary holds any execution until this, this, these transactions are, are flowing in the system. So this is, this is not cumulative with the other ones. It's another one. What is really important from this and what gives a lot of, of flexibility is the fact that you can do this per transaction. Imagine that you have your system, because I will show you the numbers, but of course that this takes a toll, okay? Eventual is like the values will be there. You will be sure that the values will be there. Eventually in time. What happens is that it takes a toll. So imagine that your application, that you want to be sure that for instance, your application needs a sync point every hour. And you need to be sure that when you write to that row, everyone has the same value. So for that transaction, you can do set session. You do, for instance, before and after, you go completely wild, okay? I really need to be sure, okay? You do before and after. And after you do that transaction, you go back to eventual, okay? You can run with global before and after, but, but that will take a huge toll. These are the numbers, okay? So as you see, you have a decrease as you get more, uh, you need, as you get more restrictive on your data requirements, you'll get, here's the toll, okay? But you will be, for, if, for instance, if you are before and after, you will be really, really sure that you're reading and writing upon the, the freshest set of data. So this is the, the, the biggest feature that, that we had released on the latest version. In terms of operations, uh, and it, it's never, it's never, 
never we also I always need to emphasize this on presentations because people tend to go and talk with me in the end. Everything that I speak here is available on the off-the-shelf MySQL Community Edition, okay? This is not something that you need to pay, it's not enterprise, it's off the shelf, okay? This is with MySQL that you download on MySQL.com, okay? So all of these automations, all of these configurations, all the documentation is publicly available. So um, in this case, we <clears throat> we have some fancy techniques, okay? Meaning that we need to acknowledge that we are running a cluster, okay? We are not running rogue MySQL instances. So your expectations as an app developer is that the data is transparent to you, you're writing to, to a, so you use a string to write to a to a data to a data endpoint, and you're not worried what's happening what's happening beneath. So what's happening here is that we admit that every node that's used for group application will be used solely for group application. Meaning that you have you add a node to the group, that node is in the group. When you go there and do stop, that group, that node will get out of the group with with the read-only attribute enabled, meaning that you are not able to do anything with that. This avoids things like, okay, I've stopped that node. Okay, for me now it's a rogue node. Oh, cool, it's a rogue node. I will add some rows here. Ah, I will do start group application again. It's on a group again, but it has like 10 more transactions than the group. And then everything goes berserk here. So we need to avoid this. And for that, what, what we do is that we have fencing mechanisms. The same here. So we can do the parallel. This is another, this is another uh, fencing mechanism. This is the fencing mechanism of involuntary exits, okay? Meaning that this exit was voluntary, so you've added a node to the group, it's operating, and then you do stop, the, the node gets out voluntarily of the group. Here, it's on involuntary events, things like, okay, I've had an error applying my changes, or the network was completely flaky and the node was expelled, okay? The group self-healed. So what happens now is that this node is fenced out and you can decide how to fence it. If you enter in read-only, like in this case, or if you abort the server. Abort the server is lit literally crash the server, okay? So it's completely out. So you're not able to do anything with this server. So these are the two fencing techniques which you, which provide an extra layer of security, considering that that node belonged to a group. Primary promotion, uh, you are able to attribute weight to the, to the group members, okay? You can say, okay, because on the default, every member has the same weight, okay? So if a, sec if a primary crashes, the probability of having the second node or the third node or the fourth node uh, being elected is the same. On this case, you had weights to your node saying, okay, no, I want if this guy crashes, I want that guy to be promoted, okay? Of course, if you have the same weight of 50-50, they will be promoted again with the same probability. Uh, <clears throat> and this is the most radical approach in which, okay, I want this guy to be the, the primary. And this is done online. so. This is important to emphasize, so you don't need to stop the group saying, I want this guy to be the primary, and now I want it to happen. So you can do this, you can, you can move your weights online, and on the next reconfiguration it will choose, for instance, here an ID. On this case it's even more extreme, in which you go to the group and say, okay, this guy was my primary, now this guy is my primary. <coughs> so this is, this is again operations. By default, group replication is single primary mode. It means that you will only be able to write on one node and the other nodes are read-only. We have multi-master support. We don't allow it because it has some limit. We don't allow it by default because it has some limitations. You can read those limitations on the documentation. I won't go very far on those. Uh, nevertheless, if you are sure on what you're doing and you want to allow writes on every on every nodes on the group, you can do it. Before you had to stop the group, change it to, to multi-master, and then put it online back online. Now you just go online and it's an online operation. Relaxed member ev eviction. Uh, the group is self-healing. Okay? 
since the group is self-healing. What happens is that when we implemented this, we were kind of, let's say, fascists, and it was a five-second delay, okay? If you were if you had on if you were on the flaky network, like it could happen, for instance, on cloud, or if you if you're migrating one virtual machine from one LAN to another, this could happen, okay? And you don't want your member to be evicted from the group. But the five-second rule was really was really that pinpoint, okay? Five seconds. If you don't communicate with the group, you will be expelled. And now you can configure that time, okay? Your failure will be detected after five seconds. So it will light up saying, okay, you, this node is unreachable, okay? But it won't be expelled from the group, okay? Because of that, because nodes were expelled from the group, and having in mind that you want to automate as much as possible all operations, what happens here is that one largely requested feature was, but I want my node to get back to the group automatically. So we implemented what we call the automatic cluster rejoin, in which the node leaves involuntarily, meaning that it was expelled from the group. Everyone said, okay, that guy's faulty. Please expel it. Uh, what happens is that if you configure auto rejoin to be true, it means that every five minutes, this guy will try and rejoin the group, okay, without user intervention. Monitoring. Monitoring is a very relevant part of of, um, of MySQL and especially on replication. Uh, those of you that use MySQL and MySQL replication might recall of using show slave status and stuff like that, so commands. MySQL since 5.6 has something called performance schema, okay, chart tables, in which you can see status of the system, okay. Now we have more things like the information schema and stuff like that, but um, monitoring is something that's really important. This was something that was on our back for some years because we have, we always have uh, some fuss on the way that we monitor the lag between slaves and masters, okay? Uh, seconds behind master was something that was horrendous. And years and years has passed since we fixed this, and we fixed this, okay? But how, how did we fix this? With performance schema tables. Meaning that, for instance, if you have this replication topology, now you have a performance schema table saying, okay, the transaction left this node here, entered this node here, was applied on the database. So you have performance schema entries for, with times, okay, with timestamps for each and every step. Okay, so this is important because this is this was a requirement from the um, the enterprise monitor. So this this came from it was an internal request from the enterprise monitor, but which is very interesting for the community. Which means do your it's kind of a DIY <clears throat> seconds behind master. So you have here the values now. Do it yourself. Okay, we start we stop being let's say. Uh, we stopped doing it, doing it ourselves, okay? Because seconds behind master had, had always a ton of a ton of issues. So, like I said here, you have performance schema entries for all of these bits and pieces, and you have per stage timestamps, meaning you have timestamps here, 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 and here. It's like, if I recall correctly, there are nine entries or something like that. So it's kind of do it yourself now. And for ease of management, you are able to, in every uh, group member, you are able to see group statistics, okay? So it's not that you have one line for this one and you need to be able to communicate with all three nodes and then sum all the data that you have in different nodes. It's just, okay, in every each and every node, you have your, your information there. So we also <clears throat> monitor the... Um, this is quite specific. It's we monitor the the amount of memory that we use for each for to because our Paxos implementation maintains a cache of transactions that uh, that flow through the group. So as you imagine, if you have a big cache and if you're flowing a ton of transactions, you need to be able to monitor that memory. So that's the value that we made available. As you see from here, select star from memory summary gobbled by event name 
where event name and you have like GCS XCOM, this is a performance schema table. So this is a good example of what is a performance schema table. Performance, yes, because that's another demand that we have. We need to be fast on this. Uh, <clears throat> right set parallelization. Um, we have something since 5.6, also since 5.6, which is called multi-threaded slave, meaning that a master commits a transaction, sends it to the slaves, and then you have multiple threads that are able to to commit that to the to the to the database and to the binary log and to the relay log. What happened is that the first version of multi-threaded slave was per schema. So actually it was only parallel if you had different schemas. The second was something that was we call it a logical clock, which is okay, I will apply in parallel if this transaction was written in parallel in the master server. And then <clears throat> we generalized what we discovered and implemented in group replication to the whole replication, which is a right set parallelization. So you mine, vi vi you mine the right set, you, s you see if there is no conflict. So you do the same that we do in group replication. So if you see if you have a, a conflict and if you don't have a conflict, you can apply it in parallel. So that's that's the exam set technology, but so it was something that group replication donated to the classical replication. It was interesting that interaction, and it was backported, like I said here, to five seven twenty two, and you can see what we have here. So commit order, right set, and right set session. Right set session is exactly the same thing that I explained, but per session, okay? Meaning per per master per master session what you can have exactly in the slave so things that don't intersect between sessions this will this allowed us group replication i say us because i work on the group replication team uh so the group the group replication provisions a node when and when a node enters the group it's provisioned via a classical replication link give me everything that you have since okay then you have the bin logs, and then he reads the bin logs, and he provides a new server. The cool thing about this is that we donated to the classical replication, and then it was beneficial to us, because then we can catch up faster when we recover a node. But since I'm talking about recover nodes, and in the morning Keith talk about MySQL backup, okay, which is the, the enterprise application that we have to, to generate backups, whoops, Okay, uh, to generate backups, <clears throat> we implemented something in 8017, which is the clone plugin, okay? which is something generic for the whole MySQL, in which you say, I want to clone this node from that node. Okay? It's a full clone. Slot, MySQL, MySQL backup, it's, it's smart, okay? because it's able to do partial, partial copies. This is, a full, this is a full copy, meaning that, okay, in this case, I want to clone uh, D, let's say, from B. Uh, what happens is it, it, you will have a, a data snapshot from B, from D. So it will overwrite all data that you had in D. So you need to be really careful when using this. So it means that, except the configurations, this will be completely wiped out. Okay? So it's really fast because it's physical. It goes directly to InnoDB. But nevertheless, the th you will have your node wiped out, okay? But he's able to catch up, so we'll he joins the group, he creates a classical replication link to, to catch up with, with the small amount of data that he lost between when this process was started and is up and running. <clears throat> uh, what you see here is uh, as numbers of the, of the time that you take to enter the group in the process times the size of changes of bin log, because the the problem with having the bin logs was besides having the bin logs in creating a classical replication link, the problem is that you had to store the whole bin log since the beginning of time if you want to have a new node to the system. With this, you completely forget that, okay? You just snapshot a node, is ready to enter a group. Nevertheless, you can configure a threshold in which a node senses the ones that are in the group he sees, okay, I'm just 10 transactions 
on the threshold, okay, I can recover using bin logs, or is I'm completely empty, or I'm 100 transactions before the group, so I need to I need to clone. Okay, you have this this type of of this implemented. Oh, pa, 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 pa. we have via cluster throughput, but this is this is work that we've. I don't have anything to say here. This is like before it was worse. Now it's better. Okay. Uh, F efficient replication of the, of JSON documents. So, have you seen it, uh, since you've seen in the morning that we are able to have JSON, but for replication, JSON was like a blob. Okay, and implementing this JSON is not a blob anymore. So we are able to mine JSON, understand that it's basically to have the same that we have uh, on. Um, on classical replication with row replication in which you can have transfer the full snapshot or just transfer the bits and pieces that were changed. Here we're able to mine the JSON document and transfer all the bits and pieces that were changed. Okay. Again, numbers about it. Security, this is a big thing, okay? So Oracle and MySQL. This is mainly a directive from Oracle that we embedded really good on MySQL, which is we're secure by default. Okay, meaning that everything needs to be secure. SSL connections are default, so everything is secure. So we've <clears throat> we ended what happened in the past, which was you provision the 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 root the 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 root user and root user did not have any password, so now it generates a random pass password. You need to go so. Everything now is secure by default. What happens here is that the bin log was something, the bin log is a file, okay? It's a file on disk, you can go there and the file is open. But with this implemented, the bin log can be encrypted, meaning that the bin log is encrypted and the relay log, which is also a bin log on the slave side, is also encrypted. Okay, this is what we call a two-step encryption, <clears throat> meaning that you configure a bin log encryption saying yes or no, and then you have two tier encryption, one master key, which is stored on the key ring within MySQL, which is the key that allows to decrypt the one key per file for each one. So you have here one key per file on the bin log, you have a key for that bin log, and you have an index of the key that generated this, and you are able to pick up this, decrypt this, and then access your file data. What do we have more on this? So this is the part of security. It does it doesn't have, have any impact all on it. So it's it's awesome. Uh, other things that I can uh, highlight: we change a lot of defaults, and we change a lot of defaults exactly because of group replication. So all of these make so classical replication got a lot of input like. The, for instance, a write set based replication from group replication, it got on par with group replication. And what means is that these defaults will work good both with group replication and it will they will work good with classical replication. Hence, we change it. For instance, binary log is on by default. So it was something that was a nightmare, like in 5.5 or 5.6. Oh my God, binary log is on by default. We will have a performance toll of 10 times our. This will be unusable, we won't be able to use this, oh my god. But this change, exactly because of group replication, that needs the binary logs to be able to do the recovery. The logging of slave updates is on by default, meaning that the slaves will write their own binary log after receiving the changes from the master. Uh, the replication metadata is by default on ODB, row-based row now ha does hash scans and row-based is, is default. Transaction write set extraction is on by default. Binary log expiration is longer, it's 30 days. And server ID is set to one by default instead of zero. This is really important because this means that for every MySQL that you install, replication is enabled by default. This was the old mindset in which replication was not enabled by default. If you would see the, the zero on the server ID, it would mean that, okay, 
no mass, this is master of no one, this is not a slave, replication is not enabled. This is a really, it seems, it seems really like, ah, it's a zero to one, but no, this is a chain of mindset. It means that replication is really out of the box and you can start using it out of the box. So some of the changes in general from, from 8.0, <clears throat> so uh, instrumentation, instrumentation, meaning that we have a lot of data now in performance schema table. For instance, support those names on, on the whitelist because it's, this is one of the security key points that we have on group application. Uh, fine tuning cross replication policies because we allow, sorry, when you are upgrading from one version to, to another, we allow rolling upgrades and rolling downgrades. So you need to have your cross, your cross replication policies really well thought of. So efficient code paths, uh, configurable communication pipeline size for a group uh, for a group application. This means that you're <coughs> sorry that you you are able to decide the number of transactions that you have pen pending on the communication side. This was really important, uh, the large transaction thing, because we we didn't do fragmentation, so it was really hard to pass through the consensus algorithm big transactions. This was really requested by the community and by by our customers. Uh, protocol compression on the bin log uh, for security transient replication files and IPv6 support. This was, for instance, this was Facebook. Facebook wanted this like mad. Uh, the roadmap. So this is, I'm an Oracle since uh, May 2013. So this was like the first version. Okay, I still feel the pain. Uh, <laughs> and this is, the path, so since 2014 to 2019. This is a mature product. This is the group replication part. The synchronous replication is more than mature. Now it's mature, it's used in production. It's, inter it's interesting because we have a, mit a mismatch between our customers that really use IndB cluster and love it, and the community, which is still a little bit cynical about it. Because, oh, but that's not on a default package. Oh, but that's not really mature. No, it's a five-year technology, okay? Although it went GA here in 2016, it's only been three years, okay? Uh, this is really mature, and even I, even myself, I'm surprised with the adoption of this in our customer base, because the customer base, typically, they're really demanding, okay? They pass high, high amounts of data, and they say, okay, this is really awesome. It has taken the fuss of out of my daily tasks like a lot. And the conclusion, so you have lots of efficiency, more encryption features, increased operations, and give it a try. So I, I've made this specifically for Ubuntu. We have an apt repo for you. And you go packages, so these are the communi community packages, the documentation, and the MySQL block from engineers. This is actually written by us, okay? So when we do a feature, uh, so this is technical documentation. You have some tutorials here and there, but here it's actually written by us and for, for you. Again, like Keith said, what allows me to lie, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, no. Do you provide snap packages as well? Sorry? Do you provide snap packages for uh, Ubuntu? Like the installation page said that you would have to download the app packages, but I'm trying to know if there are snap based packages as well. Not that I know. No? Okay. No. I don't know that by heart. That was a question for Keith. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we really have to terminate. Yeah.